Hi, and welcome to the podcast. This is Victoria English. I'm the head coach at Alcohol Free Lifestyle. Thanks for joining me today. Here at AFL, our team has a growth mentality, growth mindset mentality. We are always looking to improve, not only for our members, but also for ourselves. So today I'm introducing you to a new member and a member who has become quickly who's quickly become invaluable to our team. David Jilks is 59 years old. He is out of Canada. He is a father to two daughters and a son and a grandfather of three. Believe me when I tell you, you want to listen to what this guy says. And after you see what he looks like on our video, you're really gonna wanna pay attention. He does not look anywhere close to 59, certainly doesn't look like anyone that you would call grandpa. David is a mindset coach. He's an expert in neuroscience. He's a personal trainer, a nutrition professional. And he's coming here today to share his story and what brought him to where he is today, what he offers to our community and to our team here at AFL. David, thanks for joining me. Always nice You're to very, see very each well. other. And David, when I met you, you were coming on to the AFL team to be a mindset coach for us. It quickly became obvious that your methodology and techniques were so valuable that we felt it was important to share you first with our Project 90 and Beyond 90 community. And now I'm thrilled that I'm bringing your message to our listeners. So let's start, I guess, kind of at the beginning of your journey that has brought you where you are today. Yeah, I mean, this is certainly not where I had expected to be. I think, um, I think most uh, young guys, in my at least the guys I hung out with uh, throughout uh, school, we uh, we always had this kind of running, a little, little bit of a running joke. But you know, we never thought we would lead past you know twenty five years of age, and it was just I don't know. It was the era. I mean, I you know I, I grew up in the um, uh, in the through the seventies, of course, and uh, you know, a lot of heavy metal, a lot of drug use, and a lot of chaos. And it was um, yeah. I mean, there was. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of dysfunction and, and I hate all these, you know, I, I'm not a fan of the catchphrases because I haven't met anybody who hasn't had some sort of tragic uh, uh, walk through life. All right. So, but it, um, but it wasn't very normal. I mean, I, like I, there was, I come from a family of six kids at home. Um, and of course that means eight people sitting down at a table at night, um, we raised ourselves because when you have that many kids, you can't parent all those children. But our, yeah, the upbringing was a bit was a bit chaotic. Um, you know, parents weren't uh, weren't very happy. My eldest brother at the time, when I guess when he was about eleven, he started looking after us. Our mother disappeared for a few days at a go, and uh, my father was off working. He'd he'd work in different parts of Canada and the U.S. You know, and again, but we were safe. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the um, white picket fence upbringing. And, uh, you know, my mother had lots of her own struggles and alcohol was one of them. And, uh, yeah, it just, and my father had to work and, um, it wasn't until actually I got older where I realized where, where a lot of this frustration came from and trying to put food on the table for six kids and struggling. And, you know, and of course, um, when he got divorced, he, uh, he actually hired a private detective to come and, um, and kind of spy on us because he needed proof that our mother was leaving. Uh, leaving is unattended for days at a, at a go. And so he gained custody of us. But I, I never really appreciated, uh, he was a very angry individual and a very big man at six foot five. Um, he made me look, I'm six feet tall. He made me look like a very small human being standing next to him. But I never appreciated what he had to go through, to put food on the table and to house, mm. to house six kids. So, you know, but it's, yeah, and it's, yeah, and I, I resented him a lot, but it took me, I had to become a, an adult before I actually had some empathy for what he That's was That's incredible. Uh, I picked up on the anger 
it makes sense. Certainly growing up in that era of heavy metal, uh, drug use was very common. I can see how that would have been a welcome outlet for the anger. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, it, it, you know, I, I've kind of realized over time, the more I studied, you know, I got into my particular field of interest that, uh, you know, and Tony Robbins talks about this a lot, that we're always look, seeking to avoid pain and to find pleasure and comfort and wherever that, wherever that might be. And, uh, of course, you know, drugs and alcohol provide a tremendous amount of comfort you know, momentarily. And, and it was just an interesting environment. And I kept, I kept being, you know, kind of being pushed into these interesting spaces. I left home when I was 13 for the first time. And, um, and it was, uh, you know, I guess back in the day, I, I kind of viewed it as um, one of these movies I used to watch as a kid, these black and white movies of, uh, you know, of, uh, of a pirate, right? <laughs> this is a grand adventure. And, and there's lots of things that happen along the way. I mean, when you're, when you're out on the street as a kid, um, you're, you walk, the very first people you meet are all the predators out on the street. And I spent time, so I'm a little kid from, I grew up in uh, New Brunswick in the East Coast of Canada, so a little community where mainly all my relatives and then spending time in California and hitchhiking all through California. And of course, it was just, um, we met met the worst of the worst of humanity um, during that time. Because, well, that's what you, that's what you see at street level. And in as much as I wouldn't want to, <laughs> wouldn't want to live that lifestyle again, it really did show me a lot. It taught me a lot about people, uh, and of course, maybe very street smart, um, very cautious, a bit hypervigilant. You know, because you had to be super sensitive to the environment around you. You didn't. You learn learn not to trust people, right? Taking everything at face value. And it's uh, and of course, you know that experience led to you know that stupidity of that time and the the um, the youthful arrogance of that time, in and out of jail until I got uh, I got into trouble here in my hometown or the town I live in now. When I was a teenager, and I got sent to prison with um, my co-conspirator just as a scared straight. And so went to a local prison with the, uh, with the rest of the inmates. And that was my opportunity to realize um, that, that I, yeah, I don't want to live here, right? These are not my friends. I don't want to hang out with these people. But I, I always got this sense, um, you know, and it's that, that, um, that God grabbed me by the top of the head and said, listen, I'm going to take you through a bunch of near-death experiences. I'm going to almost kill you. And I'm going to drop you here, almost get you addicted to the point where, you know, it's going to ruin it. I'm almost going to have you imprisoned. I'm, you're going to be missing a big chunk of your life. I'm going to put you around predators. I'm going to put you around all this insanity just so that later on in life that you have a, you have a very well-rounded perspective of what not to do. And you can understand what people are going through. And so it's more of a, it's instead of a wagging finger of a, being a mentor or a counselor, it's more of a, you know, listen, brother, sister, I've been there. Like, I know how you feel. I felt the same way. Yes. And here's how I found my way out. And, uh, and so it was a really a gift because I think all the work and the study I did uh, um, when I returned back to Canada when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, the studying wouldn't have made, the different, wouldn't have made any difference because I had no context for the, for the journey. Mm -hmm. And it's been invaluable that way for me. You just shared a lot of things that I, I didn't know. I'm hearing much of this for the first time. And I'm putting together puzzle pieces in my head as I reflect on the time, the conversations we've had, the way that I've seen you interact with our members. And uh, it's, it's making a lot of sense. When you were describing being at street level and you described the hypervigilance and the wariness, the word that pops out to me, of course, is amygdala. So for our listeners, if you've listened to enough of our episodes, you've certainly heard us talk about the neuroscience of addiction and how when we are in fight or flight, even without substances, the amygdala, the more primitive part of our brain, is in overdrive. Combine that with some extraordinary situations, surroundings, substances, and your male energy. And I can 
understand that your amygdala must have been making many, many choices for you. Yeah, well, and it's, um, it's, it's an interesting process that, uh, because I grew up in that environment where, you know, when you're children, you don't have, uh, you don't have the intelligence, you, you know, you can't calibrate intelligently the adults around you. All you know is that your emotional intelligence, it's like I, I used to describe it as my spidey sense. When was it safe to go talk to mom? When was it safe to be around dad, right? And you would calibrate that by the energy in the room. And so for, for people who grow up in that environment, you know, they become hypervigilant because, well, you have to, right? Just for safety's sake. And then you take that in, then if you take that, uh, that hypervigilance into, into a street level, and then you, you fine tune it. And the only way to feel good is to get high. The only way to, to get away, because you never learned the process. There was never, nothing was ever safe. It was either danger or high danger or high and high was the only time you could feel safe in your body. I think that's relatable to anyone listening to you right now. So what David's describing, there are clearly, there are some very dramatic moments woven throughout his story. However, I very much related to what David said about trying to assess the energy in your home within your family of origin. This doesn't mean that any of us had terrible parents. If you're a parent like David is, like I am, we are terribly fallible and painfully human. However, revisiting those feelings of when you were young, maybe it wasn't so dramatic, but maybe you you knew when you walked into your home, you were assessing. Is it a good day? Is it a, is it a bad day? Where, where are things? And it, it had very little to do with, with us, with, right? And so the brain learns that. And then the brain learns alcohol, drugs, give us a break from it. Because that's a tremendously stressful way to live. Then David shares some things that were more dramatic than things that I've encountered, maybe that you've encountered, or maybe not. The brain doesn't know the difference. The amygdala knows when it's in fight and when it's in flight. So David, I have a question. You described the the scared straight program. I've heard of, I've, I've met other people who've been exposed to that. It's, it's, it's incredible. And it sounds like you're, logical brain by that point you you know your prefrontal cortex was slowly coming along and starting to grow up able to anticipate the future perhaps slightly aware of your mortality and so you're looking at this situation and 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 the smart part of your brain is saying hey man this isn't going to go well for you it's time to make some changes how did you go from that awareness of, whoa, this is not the path I, I, I can stay on. It's, it's talk about unsafe. This is going to end very, very badly. How did you get from amygdala driven, having these huge emotions of anger that you'd been masking for so long to a place where you were at least open to trying on new thoughts and new behaviors? Yeah, well, I'm not a quick study. Let's just put it that way. Um, so, uh, so there's an interesting uh, piece I'll add to this, and uh, and it was only became relevant in the last 15 years. Is that when I was five years old, um, in, in my uh, little old town in uh, Millerton, New Brunswick, I was walking across the road with my brothers and sisters, and uh, and I took a step and I looked to the left. And back in the day, you know, if you're in around my age group, you remember that cars had door handles that stuck out. The door handle stuck at about two or three inches. Well, I took a step, I looked to the left, and I caught the door handle of a moving car in the right temporal lobe. Now, that was when I was about five years old. So, again, that's, you know, it's over 50 years ago. And back then, they had no idea, right? They just said, well, he's, he's not cross-eyed, he can walk, he, you know, he has speech. When I woke up, I had a bunch of metal um, plates kind of lined up along the side of my head. It wasn't until about 15 years ago where I went and had a few, what they call them, a 
qualitative electrocephalogram. So I had basically had my head examined, which people have been telling me to do for years, apparently. And so what was interesting, and it, this really played a, played a part in my journey along the way, even though I didn't, I didn't really understand what was going on, is that the right side of my brain, this is where a lot of emotional regulation occurs from. And when my brain reaches a certain calibration, when I get under a certain degree of stress, that right side of my brain kicks out. And so I kind of go neutral, right? So my, I kind of flatten out, like taking a, sometimes antidepressants will flatten people out emotionally. Well, it's almost like a breaker goes off in my brain on the right side when I get into a certain amount of stress. And the reason why I was having, having, having my head examined was the um, going through a divorce. I, I was, uh, my practice is 14 years old. I'm just, life's crazy. I'm going 24 seven. I'm burned out beyond all belief. And I would, I would um, not recognize people in the, in the parking lot. They'd come talk to me and I have no idea who they were. So, uh, so the inability for facial recognition, I realized, but I've been studying neuroscience for a while. And I think it was just intuitive. I knew that I was going to need my own help to figure this out. So, you know, so, so that was, um, so that was a part of the issue that I had, why drugs were, drugs and alcohol and running and the inability to emotionally calibrate effectively. Um, that was one of the drivers behind it. So not only was everything, there was no emotional regulation um, being shown to me, being demonstrated by anybody in the family. Uh, my, my own brain had a problem. Internal and external. Right. So, yeah. Right. So I got a good whack to the melon. Um, and, you know, and it, so it's, and it's still something I contend with. Like I had lots of strategies I work with, but, uh, but I just want to throw that in for context because that was really, you know, and I know head trauma is, is something that we understand a lot more now, but we didn't understand it certainly way back in the day. But it's, but that, um, and that really drove, drove a lot of the drug use and that really drove, uh, I was, uh, marijuana was a big thing for me because of the ability, its ability to make me emotionally stable and give me the broad range of emotions I, I couldn't normally have. I needed something externally to provoke my brain into emotion, sort of emotional state. That's something I couldn't do on my own easily. Not only did I, I didn't have the, I didn't have the, um, the examples uh, given to me by the adults in my life, my brain, my own brain struggled with emotional stability and emotional range, mm. right? Especially under stress. So drugs seem to kick, bridge that gap for me historically. As I'm listening and you're saying yeah. an emotional range, emotional bandwidth, that that's relatable. And, and I'm sure you've seen this working with our members. David did have something organic in his brain that was exacerbating these issues. When, when I was drinking, when many of our members have, have shared this experience, we've all grown up with conditioning, certainly. And so right. for me, I was taught as a girl that anger <clears throat> was unacceptable. That is not how a young lady behaved. And so when I would drink, the anger was allowed. It's like I was carving out space for those emotions. It didn't go well. <laughs> and what I've seen in some other members is that anger was allowed. Perhaps they, because of whatever, gender, the, the culture, their, their family of origin, you know, anger was, they were fluent in anger and the other emotions were not allowed. And so sometimes I'll, ex I'm sure you've heard this as well, that members, when they would drink, they, they would allow themselves to feel sad or to grieve or to rage. I think that's an interesting point that you just brought up and one that is certainly relatable that yes, we were drinking to escape emotions, but also give ourselves permission to experience others. Yeah. There's something missing. I mean, you know, part of when I started writing a book three years ago and part of what I was looking at was the conditioning and 
looking at the lack of lack of cultural cohesiveness we have, especially in Western cultures, and your the ability to regulate ourselves emotionally um, had a lot to do with the fact that with that we had uh, we had a stable, relatively stable family um, existence, and then we had relatives and you know and you know, aunts and uncles and cousins and a community that we grew up with. And we had, we had all these feedback mechanisms and it was, it was an immediate feedback from the, the person next to you, the person next door. And so you, so society would calibrate you because if you're being a fool, then there'd be immediate pushback. But now, but now we don't have that, that, that kind of 24 uh, seven feedback mechanism from people that care about us and people that, that share the same kind of values. Now we, we have access to a million different ideas and personalities and attitudes and behaviors and we have nothing to regulate against that stable. There's no stable messaging that we're getting for our minds and let's say mind, heart and soul to calibrate against because it's so random. And, and of course, the way the algorithms work on, the, on, the, on our phones and computers is that whatever we are interested in, you know, of course it says, okay, well, this is, this is what Victoria's interested in. We're just gonna feed her more of the same. And so you get siloed into a one way of being. And then, and it's again, it's not you're not being calibrated to anything. You're just being siloed into to one one dimensional version of you, right? Which is a lot of the social anxiety that people have, the, the inability to interact with other people. Because, you know, I I, I learn how to be a, a man and to be a father. I learn that regulation capacity around other people. When I'm stupid, I get immediate feedback that pushes back against me that helps me regulate. Right. So we again. Cult, the way our cultures were set up for thousands of years seemed to be the neuroplasticity involved in emotional regulation and maturity because it was the environment around you that guided you, whether it was uh, coming of age ceremonies for young, young boys and girls, right? But we had this, we had this external guidance. We had, these, we had internal, internal um, in, intentions or potential, but it was the environment outside, the epigenetic environment of culture guided us through. Right. And yeah, and there's lots, lots of problems with uh, various cultures. And yes, we're humans. We do all sorts of stupid things. But by and large, that, that cohesive external structure was the epigenetic framework that we need to move ourselves forward, right, as a society, to know what it means to be, to grow up in a stable community as a man, to grow up in a stable community as a woman. What's my roles and responsibility as a young man, as a, you know, as a, as a neighbor, as a, as a son, as a father? Like those were relatively clear in culture. And now we don't have any of those any of those uh, uh, structures in place, and you know we've abandoned you know I think in an effort to to get rid of the the negative parts of culture we got rid of all of it, right? We we did throw the baby out of the bathwater, and that and I think that that's been a huge problem in the Western culture. That is extremely insightful. When I was speaking with another. AFL team member who has worked with you for a long time, I asked him, what are some things that, that uh, David has really, really helped you with? And one of his comments reminds, kind of ties into what I just heard you say. And you put it so articulately, and I've had those thoughts, and I've, they've never been as, as coherent as yours just were. And so... As we navigate this being put into the silo, which alcohol and drug substances will certainly uh, only make that silo tighter and more narrow. When I, it seems to me that identifying our true character might be an excellent compass. And so when I asked this team member, he said, David has taught me about operating from your character and not from how you feel. Did I get that? Did I get that right? That, that comparison? Because it, it's, yeah, that really struck me. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the difference is when you look at, when you got character development and again, you know, it, it's it's not a it's not a new uh, thought process. It's not a new conversation, but it, but it hasn't been a very deep one. And I think we, we were missing the relevance of what character character strength means. And where I, the I arrived at a conclusion and a bit of a theory uh, some years ago 
when uh, part of my work was in orthopedic, orthopedic rehabilitation. So I'd rebuild hips and knees and shoulders and backs. And along the way, of course, uh, you know, working with people, not only I'm working on the physical body, but I'm listening to the struggles and inab their inability to follow through. And of course, the human element, you know, the silly human element of what we are as well. And what was really interesting is that this language kept showing up and the language that we use to describe physical pain and limitations seem to be very similar, if not the exact same language we use to describe emotional pain and limitations. And so I thought that, you know, and so my brain, you know, was struggling with that for a little bit going, okay, this is quite similar. I can, I can develop an apprehension sign for a dislocated shoulder, but I can, be, I, I can have emotional apprehension towards uh, moving into something that's potentially uncomfortable. I can, uh, when I have, when I injure a knee, I'll have, develop avoidance patterns because of the pain and I'll, be, I'll become weak and then I'll uh, inadvertently develop these patterns of avoidance. But I do that with emotional weakness as well. If I have an emotional painful experience, I alter my behavior to avoid, of course, reoccurring pain, a painful experience. And so apprehension, inhibition, um, uh, avoidance, behavioral changes, weaknesses. And, and I just thought, I wonder, you know, the body's complicated, but but sometimes the body likes to do things as simple as possible. And would we would we need a completely different aspect of the nervous system to deal with physical pain as we deal with emotional pain? And so, you know, many years later, as I came up out of the books going, okay, that was a journey. Um, you got to be careful what kind of questions you ask, because sometimes it takes about well, five or six years to find an answer. <laughs> and what I realized that that we do contend with physical and emotional pain the same way. And this is where it gets to character. In, my, in, in the practice I do with my clients on the physical side of it, 80% of my effort is teaching them about um, uh, core strength and posture, but from a brain down, from a top-down pattern. So we talk about aspects of memory, your, your, the physical aspects of who you are stored in what we call your procedural memory, right? The, the memory of how to. And so we work on rebuilding these maps, these brand new maps of movement that are not associated to the injury, right? Because when you have, when you have a da damage to the body, the damage is also recorded here. So we're writing these brand, brand, new, brand new brain maps of movement. And I realized that if I spend 80% of my time working on the core strength and the posture, most of the problems simply went away, right? Or became, certainly became less, uh, well, we certainly became less of a problem. I thought that was so interesting so that over time, my practice turned into, well, my company was called Core Essentials, and that I realized that everything's a core exercise. And so I began training my high-level athletes, my hip replacement clients, my uh, junior A uh, um, uh, hockey players, and everybody went through the same cycle, training the brain to recognize all movements as a core exercise. And, and it was actually quite extraordinary that how well it worked. So the question was, if, if core strength and alignment helps the physical body become stronger and overcome trauma and injury and pain, what, what can we do for the emotional body? And what came out of it was character, the strength of character. And so if we, if we declare and define our character as clearly as I can define our, our intrinsic core muscles, if we can make it very, very clear that no matter what was going on inside your life currently or historically, what could rise above it is that these, these care, these, character traits, this, the strength of character, if it was so clear that all of a sudden I began to organize my entire storyline of my life to these ideals. And so instead of actually trying to fight my life on 10 different, 10 different uh, fronts where, you know, trauma over here and trauma over there, and this is 20 years ago, this is five weeks ago, this is going on right now, and this might happen in the future. I just, it was just, it was crazy making. They're going, that's just way too hard. But what was simpler, what was much, what came into more of a simple process, not easier necessarily, but much more simple was that it's my strength of character. And if I spent 80% of my effort defining, declaring, and living into this idea of character, then probably half my problems would just disappear because they were just inconsequential. They had nothing to do with reality. My brain was just so used to being afraid and being on guard that I was kept throwing these things up because it was just, that was my habit. Defining character actually got rid of almost half of my problems immediately. It is. It's and crazy. the word core ties into both. Uh, David and I share a, a background in helping people with the in through movement. And so we, we do talk in Pilates metaphors and analogies. And exactly, whenever you have 
whenever I would have a client with a knee issue, well, we could spend a lot of time on the knee and then we could spend a lot of time on the hip because the hip was jacked and then we could spend a lot of time on something else. That was exhausting. And so do, can you see the similarities? You, you, it's a brilliant example of how working on the trauma and the self-worth and the relationships and relationship with self and inner critic, exhausting. And so as a Pilates teacher, I would say, we're focusing on your core. And now I see in our program, in our coaching, we're saying, let's get to the core. What do you know to your core? What do you know is true about yourself to your core? Forget the auxiliary stuff, the, the external pain, the internal pain. Very well said, David. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, pain and struggle and suffering. Um, I mean, that's just a part of the human experience, and 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 I'm not minimizing what that looks like because it. Uh, there's people that certainly have had uh, a much more horrific uh, uh, journey through life than myself, but but it doesn't define as it's just a part. Of, it's just it's a, it's an unfortunate part of the process, and we all experience it on one level or another. But our ancestors. You know what, what I what I thought was was quite significant is that our ancestors see, always had a, a daily spiritual practice, right? There'd be meditation and prayer and something symbolically that they they looked at the world through that lens, right? Like every single culture and the similarities between all the cultures uh, was actually quite striking. Whether it's a Christian culture, Islamic, uh, Buddhist, Hindu, um, uh, Jewish culture, and I looked at the five you know most prominent faith traditions. And the similarity and, and their practices and their, their intentions were actually quite striking. Again, which led me to believe that, you know, that there's, a, there's something epigenetic about, there's something epigenetic about that whole process. And maybe that, maybe, it, maybe the world hasn't gotten um, more challenging, even though it's a bit insane currently, but, but, you know, it's always been a dangerous place for humans. We're like, we're immortal. I mean, you know, like, you know, we can die. We can, we can be taken out of the game. We could be um, killed by a wild animal. And, and the fact of the matter is that humans are, we're more sensitive to negativity, you know, because we have a risk assessment. Drive your car on the interstate, right? You're driving with a elevated level of, of awareness, hopefully. And, uh, and you're driving perpetually through risk assessment uh, uh, kind of questions and answers in your mind. Should I change lane fa too fast, too slow, right? Turn the music down so I can see better. That's an old, that's an old guy thing, right? But it's, but we're constantly under risk assessment, walking up to your car, going to the gym, and the brain is always trying to keep us safe. So risk assessment uh, and our sensitivity to, to negativity and risk is how we're wired. So what it seemed to make sense is that these spiritual practice, having a daily spiritual practice, which wasn't reading 15 different personal development books, it's actually like choose an idea, choose a path to follow. And the daily practice seemed to mitigate, seemed to offset the negativity and the risk of being alive as a mortal in the world, in a world that's potentially dangerous. And having a daily practice, like a real practice, something that's intrinsic, that sits underneath the relationship you have with the, the people that you love and sits under your under relationship with yourself and the world around you, sits under relationship with the people you work with. Like this is this ethos that that you you um, you kind of embodied as your this, this is the center of who I am. And I will look at my entire world, not parts of it, but my whole world this way and doing so you you simplified your journey. Because either it's in your character to be a certain way or it's not. And if you define that, mm. then you get to be that everywhere. And no matter where you go, there you'll be, yes. which is such a beautiful way to be anyhow. You and I briefly touched on shame before we started recording. Certainly, right. when we are stuck in the cycle of, of substance misuse, there's incredible shame. Over time, depending on how we behave, the things we say, do, the things we miss out on, the things we don't say and don't do, that shame can erode us to a point where we may start to actually believe that's who we are. However, 
we share this with our members, David, and, I, and I've shared it on this podcast before. If you are listening to this podcast, the person that shows up, the version of you that shows up when you're under the influence of this highly addictive, socially expected drug is not you. Because if it were you, you wouldn't be listening to this podcast. You'd say, well, that's how I am. And so in your core, you know the issue. In your core, you know that alcohol is trying to convince you of of things about yourself that simply aren't true. So back to talking about the root of the issue, the core of the problem. It's amazing what happens when people release their their drug of choice for for this program, it's alcohol, and how we can lean into our true selves, who we really are. I would imagine that was certainly part of your story, David. And how did being aligned with your true self, your core, how was that important in releasing the shame from things that have happened? Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because it, um, you know, it's not, it's not something you want to do in the very beginning. It's certainly not something I wanted to do. And when I'd bring ideas, experiences uh, to mind, or when they came to mind, I try not to, or chose not to try to re- think or remember certain parts of my life. I would just shudder, like my body would go through this involuntary shake, like just, you know, like like a, a, a nervous tremor just to get rid of it, like just flick the thought away, like something landed on my face. And it, it, it took a while, but it's, but it wasn't, but it wasn't the deep diving into the conversation around it again and again. And, and, and even though, uh, you know, talk therapy works well for a lot of people, uh, it, it didn't work for me. And what I, cause what I found for myself and, and I'm sure there's other people like me as well. So I, that certain things that I lived through, I'm not going to articulate it. I'm not, I'm not, not at the level that, not that the level of the, of the experience. Um, and maybe it's more of a, you know, it could be a part of a masculine trait as well. I'm going, this is never going to happen. I'm never going, what, what's in my brain, the, the storyline, the 3d storyline in my brain of these different experiences, but I, I lack the emotional uh, caliber or strength does this use those words, right? So I'm not going to, and I'm going, so, so what the hell do I do? What, what do I do with this mess in my brain? These stories that, that I, I, I don't feel like I can talk about, you know, I, I don't want to walk into traffic with my eyes closed. I'm not going to talk about it to this person here. Cause I just don't, uh, when I don't know them and develop trust, this is going to take two, three years, you know, don't have that kind of time. And so you kind of reach this impasse and I, and I kind of came to the point, and this is um, uh, actually through a, there's a spiritual author, Carolyn Miss, uh, who's, <laughs> she's a very feisty, uh, feisty old, older lady. And, uh, but she says some very, a few very prof- profound things. And on one of her TED Talks, she leans, leans on the podium and leans into the audi- audience and says, liars never heal. Right. And everybody just sits back and everybody's just shocked. And she said, liars never heal. So you can drink all the wheatgrass you want. Liars never heal. And, and that, you know, and it kind of, it, um, you know, kind of for why I laugh, because I thought, you know, it was such a funny thing to come from this, you know, this little, little old lady, but she's very forceful. And, but it, it's really, and it's, and, you know, there was a, the blunt edge of truth came out of that. And it's learning actually how to, you know, to look at, look at the experience, but, but I couldn't, I couldn't reconcile my past unless I decided who I was going to be in the future. Right. So it's that stable poise that, you know, I know, um, I know what my character is. I, I choose to live as courageously as possible. I choose to live in, uh, in truth, which is self-honesty. Not that I hold any, any, uh, um, any ancient truth, but just not lie to myself, right. Not lie to myself. I can lie to you, but I can't lie, shouldn't lie to me. And the idea of compassion. And when I selected these character traits, that became my, my daily, kind of my daily mantra. And I had to think about them, I had to experience what does it feel like to live in that space? And the more that became clear, then the answers to how do I deal with these stories became much more clear. 
You know what I mean? Like I didn't have to spend two uh, two years wrestling with it with a therapist that again, some people find great value in it. it just, I didn't because I knew that just, I wasn't going to tell them what was in the back of my brain. But as I grew in character, I, I, I developed the internal strength and I matured, you know, a, a part of my psyche matured enough that I could calibrate these stories. And then what I found is that instead of shame and fear and anger and what all the other, you know, what they call below level emotions, I was mining these experiences I never want to go through again because there was gold in them. And there, I don't think there's a person in the world that I can meet, to sit down and talk to, that I couldn't have empathy for their journey. Because I, you know, I've walked in many, many different, uh, many, many different paths. And so my empathy for people is, is much greater once I was honest with my own story. David, just in many ways, you just described the crux of alcohol-free lifestyle and our methodology. As, as you know, I, I tried years of AA, and you'll hear me say this every time I bring up AA, we support all paths to releasing alcohol. And so if that works for you, wonderful. And it did work for me to an extent. However, I also had those moments that would cause a shiver to run up my spine. Even at the thought of what could have happened. Oh, I can't, oh my gosh. And so part of the AA methodology is sharing that, sharing the war stories and what they call drunkologues and really just gutting yourself with all the nitty gritty, messy, ugly things that you did or that happened while under the influence of this drug. Over time, I found that it, it, it increased the depth of my shame because first I'm releasing the anesthesia, I'm releasing the alcohol, and then whew, I'm spending a lot of time back there talking about that version of myself. What I'm hearing you describe is a wordless healing. You are living with that, those core values, which each and every one of us has inside of us. It's the reason that we go, whoa, I've got to make a change. You had that in, your, in, in the present. And just like we do in AFL, you thought, how do I use where I am today to build the future of my choosing? A future free from the things I did, the things I said, the ways that I was hurt when I was young, stuff like that. It's, 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 an, it's, it's an interesting contrast. Again, my brain's racing mm -hmm. here as, uh, as we're talking and, and, you know, and it's, it's weird. I mean, I have, you know, my life is a bit surreal. Um, you know, like it's, I, <laughs> you just look at, you know, the, the trail of carnage in my wake and a lot of it of my own doing. And, you know, from the, from the drug and alcohol lifestyle, from uh, being a street kid to being a bit of a, a minor criminal, um, you know, leaving school at an early age. And, and, and now I look at, you know, I just had this really extraordinary life and, um, it, and the, a lot of the shame I had was around uh, never finishing school, not having education. Not, and, and yet I still have a grade 10 education and yet I'm doing a distance course in medical neuroscience through Duke and a lot of my friends are doctors and, uh, you know, and scientists. And then I realized that just that path, the, the typical path that most people go through just wasn't for me. And I never would have arrived at any of the conclusions I came to if I didn't actually just go out and kind of run amok <laughs> to the world for those many years. And I wasn't forced to think in a particular way. I had, you know, nobody said, you know, A plus B had to be followed by C, had to be followed by D. And I was just kind of freestyling uh, out through the world. And I had a brain, my brain, I got a capacity for, uh, for uh, complex ideas and intricacies. I love wrestling with things. And, but nobody told me that, um, nobody told me how, how, nobody told me how to think. Nobody told me that I couldn't. 
And so I just entertained ideas. And, and then when I stepped back in, into the, um, into the world, started developing uh, some mentors, uh, you know, who are professors uh, from different universities and doctors. And, and they were just astonished going like, so where'd you go to school? And I'm going, um, well, I read this book sitting down because I was interested in, I was interested in it. And so I had a medical dictionary and then I had <laughs> this book and I, you know, every four or five words going, what the hell does that mean? So I'd flick and open up the book and all right, so that's what that means. And this thing means red, this mean, it means front, this thing means back. And so I was just fascinated because once I healed and once I got the drugs out of my system and, I, and my body was getting healthier, I was, there was this amazing world in front of me. And, and, I have, and that was 30 years ago. And I haven't stopped being this curious five-year-old, especially living in this, this 100 trillion cell organism that you know, has a thousand reactions per cell per second then all we have to do is keep this thing alive. Like look at look after your body like a house plant, right? Give us some sunlight, some water, and some food, and it'll be good. But it's but I became less ashamed of my past and the stupid things I had done, the foolish things I had done. I became more fascinated by the miracle of what I am as a human. And going, I just want to spend the rest of my life figuring this thing out because this is extraordinary. And yet, you know, and yet people we we get so frustrated and so hard on ourselves. And, but yeah, we do all, all sorts of stupid things, but you're still a living miracle, no matter how much of a fool you are. <laughs> you're still a living miracle. And if you just lean into it, just lean into the miracle that you are and be just a little bit curious about what it takes to run this thing. And that's why on the onset, you said, you know, it's hard to believe I'm 59. I have no idea what the hell that means. It's like no arthritis, no joint issues. I, I'm training like I was 20 years ago. Um, you know, a little bit of gray hair, maybe a little bit smarter perhaps, but you know, and that's, that's debatable. You have to ask around. I'm sure opinions vary, <laughs> but it's, uh, but we're just a living miracle. And, and I, and yes, you know, we, we, we unfortunately stumble into these substances that can just, you know, that can wreak havoc on our lives, but it happens to a lot of people and it's been happening for a long time. As you said, it's a very socially acceptable um, you know, socially acceptable, um, uh, very toxic drug. And so for me, it's just those experiences, it, it was what it was. And on the other side of it, it forced me to wrestle and grasp, wrestle with a bunch of ideas. It forced me to wrestle with, with the truth. And if I didn't have the struggle, I never would have gotten to any, any particular truth. If that, if that had been really easy, I wouldn't have been curious about what I've been up to. I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been in the, the kind of health or shape I am. I wouldn't be studying. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, voluntarily take on really complicated things. But, but I realized that at the, at the end of the day, you know, a, life really makes much more sense and is much more enjoyable when we, when we voluntarily find things to go struggle with and, and, not, and not try to avoid them, right? We find things to struggle with and we lean into it and find something else. I've overcome that. What's the next struggle? What's the next opportunity for growth? And seek it out. And it makes life exciting, right? And, and if you keep doing that, you'll never get old because life is just far too interesting, far too exciting to live. I love it. I love it. So for our listeners, if you find yourself in that cycle of, of shame and perhaps some of the shame and some of the self judgment around, Oh, why can't I just fix this alcohol thing? Perhaps that's holding you back. We understand that our invitation right now is, what would it feel like to get curious, to be curious? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, that felt bad. How do I move forward? What would it feel like to not focus on the past? What would it feel like to, as David said, mine for gold and use it to your advantage? moving forward because I agree the things that I've gone through in life I had a choice wallow which I've done at times I'm not gonna lie I have my moments we all do I'm human or use it as fuel so when we've gone through something like alcohol use disorder, I'm just using this as, a, as an example because every listener has their own stuff. What if it wasn't 
your downfall. What if it's the fuel that you need to really live the life that's meant for you? And that's where David and I love to talk about the choice. That's where the choice comes in. Is this where it ends for you? Is this it? Well, I've got this drinking thing and uh, yep, this is just my story. If you're listening to this podcast, the answer is no. There's something inside, right, David, saying, "Uh uh-uh, this isn't how it's going to end for me. The obstacle is the way. As the as the popular saying goes, and one of my one of my favorite things, uh, you know, to walk my walk clients through, is the uh, the hero's journey tale, and it's predominantly a masculine story, but but it, it works well for women as well. And you know, you're always going to encounter these things. You're going to encounter uh, you know um, alcohol use issues or drug issues or whatever the case may be. There's always going to be something that's going to force you to grow up. It's going to challenge your ideas, challenge your current state of uh, spiritual maturity. I mean, that's, I, for me, that's what it comes down to. And inside these beautiful, very ancient stories, I mean, if you run away from the dragon, the fire-breathing dragon, next time you encounter the dragon, guess what? You're smaller, the dragon's bigger. Every time you run, the problems always get bigger. Or if you, and if you've read any of these stories about knight, uh, knights of the round table and dragons, if you look at a dragon in the eyes, right? You see, if you just stare transfixed at the dragon, of course, you become paralyzed once you numb out. The dragon leans over and devours you whole, right? You're done. As soon as you become numb, you're done. But conversely, there's a, the third part of it is that you can wander around the corner and there happens to be a fine young maiden dressed in white tied to a tree. There's a dragon and there's a cave full of treasure. And what this very ancient story that it's in every culture in one, in, in one iteration or the other, the story is pointing to is that there's always going to be these dragons. You're never going to escape it, right? Death is the only escape. You're never going to escape these dragons, these, these, this adversity. But the, the likelihood of you facing the dragon and winning depends on your character. And the young maiden represents virtue. She re- represents character. And the only reason you're going to go after that, you're going to fight that dragon, is, for, is because you, it's for the strength of character. It's, it's your virtue comes forward. It becomes very clear when your life feels dark and cumbersome and, and hopeless. It's just, you know, it's your character that needs to come through. And you're being forced to expose something that seemed a bit intimidating. Perhaps you didn't even feel worthy of even being this kind of person. But I assure you, that's exactly who you are. And when you realize that this isn't my character, it's, in my, it's, it's my nature to be this person, I'm willingly going to attack this problem, even if it kills me. It's still important. And if I win the battle, which is quite often we do, the cave full of treasure becomes you. Like you're so much more valuable. You're just so rich in experience and character and strength. That's who you become to the community. Not only for you, but for everybody connected to you. And it's, and and I do believe in these journeys that, you know, I was given the rite of passage and, you know, the near death experiences of my history, because if I'm here wrestling with the idea, I'm here listening to the conversation. I'm being back and forward on my, that final part of the journey right? To pick up my sword, stand up to expose my character and become a valuable resource. And somebody somewhere perhaps won't listen to us here, but they'll listen to you. And you'll be the change that people need, right? It's just, we, we have these amazing lives where we can really be these heroes in the story. And, and, and I think that's, again, that's the exciting part about life is that, yeah, I'm, I'm not happy about a lot of things that I did. Uh, I'm not happy a lot of things that I experienced. But unfortunately, but I wouldn't, I really wouldn't change a lot of it because I had the ability, I get to have these conversations every single day of my life. And I go, that's it. I mean, and I get paid to do it. I would do it for free. <laughs> you know, don't, don't tell my boss that, but, <laughs> but it's, but what an extraordinary thing to go through life to take all, all that was uh, dark and ugly and forbidden and what you thought was disgusting about your history and turn it into this beautiful superpower that, that you can use to heal the lives of so many other people. And somebody's waiting for you, as many mm-hmm. people were waiting for me mm-hmm. and yourself. Yes, the hero of your own story. Yes. Yeah. And what might the world miss out on if you don't do this? What, what might you be able to do? 
I'm, I'm sure David and I never thought that we would be doing what we're doing today, but here we are until we knew, right? There came a point where I knew, okay. And that was a sign of, of my own healing that I was prepared to then go assist others. Uh, but again, if, if you feel that you might not be worth releasing alcohol because of what you've done, another invitation to reframe. What might the world miss out on yeah. if you don't? Mm -hmm. David, yeah, thank you very, very much for being here. Incredible message. Uh, you have certainly been helpful to me as a coach with my mindset and, and, and a, a, good, a good colleague, a good friend. Love our conversations and our members can't get enough of David. And so if something on this episode resonates with you, pay attention. It's a sign. It's not an accident that you're listening to this episode on this day. And so pay attention. Follow it. Let's see what happens. Be that playful, curious kid. Until next time, take good care. Have an awesome day.